Hello! I love making people jump. How's everybody doing tonight? Yay! Yay! Yeah, come on! Welcome to the very first Technically Funny Night. Tonight we'll be featuring, as every Thursday night, a Technically Funny Science talk show. Followed by Comedy Lab, a place for experimental comedy. There'll be a comedy game show and some of the best Barcelona stand-up comedians, yeah? Woo! That's right. All right, so without further ado, let's begin our Technically Funny Science talk show. Yes! Okay, so I'll be your host this evening, Ma Dr. Matthew Murtha. I don't understand why that's funny. I'd like to introduce my, my co-host for the evening, uh, Hannah Becker. She won Barcelona's Funniest Stand-Up Comedian in 2016. She's a wonderful actress, comedian, and translator. Okay, thanks. Welcome. <laughs> Hey guys, what's up? All right, so as a reminder, Technically Funny, a Technically Funny Science talk show is recorded uh, to be broadcast over the internet via podcasts and YouTube and actually on the radio as well. Um, this of course means that we're broadcasting to millions of people worldwide, of course, right? Millions of listeners. Millions. And then for my listeners at home, uh, this, is being, this is being taped in a gigantic theater with thousands of people. What, let's give the listeners at home a, a, a sound of what a thousand knowledge-hungry scientists sounds like. Yes. Exactly. Tonight well, we're going to be talking with Dr. Kadri Reese, an advocate for effective altruism. Uh, that is a method of making sure that your charitable dollars get used in the best possible light. And uh, with charity and giving as our theme tonight, we can welcome our, our special guest, Mother Teresa. Let's give her a hand, Mother. Not, not Mother, you're the mother of Teresa. Oh my God, I'm sorry. What a disappointment. Very, very confusing. <laughs> Mother Teresa, Madre de Teresa? <laughs> All right. That shows you guys, Spanish is not funny. <laughs> okay, so with that, Hannah, any big news this week? Um, Performances? No? No. Um, this Sunday is Burn It Down, a show that our guest, Kadri, co-hosts. Yeah? So that's Sunday nights at 8 o'clock at... 23 guitars, made the, 23 guitars in Poblasek. Right, the very best awesome. in uh, open mic comedy The and best music. open mic. All right, so with that, we would like to begin our comedy news and science. What would be a talk show without a, a crafty jingle <laughs> and amazing technical abilities? All right, Hannah, you want to kick us off? Yes, let's kick it off. Um, as we all know, uh, unfortunately, women tend to be underrepresented in academic fields that are stereotypically associated with high-level intellectual ability, such as physics or philosophy. And many think that this starts at a young age. <laughs> so women are dumb from a young age. <laughs> Incorrect. Incorrect. In, in fact, published this week in Science, BM and all studied young children to assess whether these differences are intrinsic or if they're adopted. What they found is that at age five, children seem not to differentiate between boys and girls in being, quote, really, really smart. This is a technical term uh, <laughs> that children use to connotate uh, adult brilliance, right? Okay. So at age five, uh, boys and girls have the same expectations of who can be really, really smart. But by age six, girls are already beginning to lump more boys than girls into the category of being really, really smart and finding which, uh, and assigning them to jobs that are normally associated with being uh, brilliant. So these findings suggest that gendered notions of brilliance are acquired early and have an immediate impact on children's interests. Yeah, 
One finding that was c- across the board for five-year-olds and six-year-olds was um, trying to avoid any future career with a high risk of cootie infection. Serious, serious concern of, of five- Cooties? and six-year-old children. A terrible disease afflicting children across the world. Yeah. Do they have cooties in Spain? And what do you call cooties in Spanish? Like when a like when you're like a six year old girl and a boy kisses you, you go like ew cooties. Like you don't have that. You all like right. kissing. Okay, that's true. Spanish kids do kiss each other all the time. It's that's weird. just a terrible stereotype. <laughs> it's very Hannah. weird. No, I've seen it. I've seen it with my own eyes. All right. The last like in person, not on the internet. Don't worry. Don't worry, guys. The last finding of the study turns out that. Uh, children of both genders, of course, hate child- other kids that are really, really smart and instead prefer to hang out with kids who uh, have candy cigarettes and tiny leather jackets. Of course, the cool ones. They're born cool. Yeah. All right, moving on into hair science. Uh, a, a hair scientist named Albert Maines, who happens to be bold, <laughs> conducted... <laughs> I it promise it has nothing to do with the report. He studied in 2012 with 60 subjects. He wanted to test how people, how people felt about men who were completely bald. So he assigned these subjects and he gave them pictures of a man with uh, his full head of hair and then completely shaved off. Yes, oh, the subjects reported okay. that they, they thought that the bald men were more dominant, they were bigger, they were stronger, more successful. These are things that Manus would shout at his ex-wife's voicemail when he was really drunk on a good bender. Like, yeah, and, and they're really good at sex, too. Yeah. Actual Classic quote from Manus. the study. Actual quote. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was All in right. there. Now, I felt like this study had a lot of different flaws to it. There were, the number of subjects wasn't very high. The statistical properties weren't very strong. And the most important caveat, of course, though, is that the men had to be completely hairless, yeah? You couldn't have a bald spot or be patchy or male pattern baldness. Yeah, because I mean, you know, there's, there's nothing sadder, there's nothing sadder than a, a good looking man who goes bald too young, you know? <laughs> or just ugly men who are bald at yeah. all. I wonder though, these men, the men, the picture of the man that they showed, I mean, did he start off with a bad haircut or a beautiful, amazingly affordable five euro Packy oh, no. haircut. I don't think the study controlled for for haircuts. And see, that's the problem with this study. It makes me so upset to see poorly designed studies out there and then be reported widely. It makes me want to rip out my hair, and I would, I would, if it wasn't so thick and lustrous. Look at that. It's a good head of hair. That's right. Good head of hair. Um, In an effect to improve the breeding program for apes in the Netherlands, researchers have created an app that has been dubbed the Tinder of orangutans. (laughs) Using a tablet, apes look at pictures of potential mates and react by pushing a button on the screen. This is a real thing. and they totally real. (laughs) Absolutely. So they actually, they had done these studies with bonobos first, right? And what they found with bonobos is that they, this is another type of ape, yeah? Um... These bonobos actually, uh, they show a strong preference for photos of other apes that are doing um, positive active activities such as like sexual behaviors and searching for lice. Yeah, classic positive behaviors, searching, searching for lice. I just have to mention that this is what Hannah looks for in her, yeah. her dates when she tinders. When also. I'm on Tinder, it's who's looking for lice? That's the man for me. Um, male apes, however, seem to just swipe for everyone. They were just just going for it. Female apes, on the other hand, always said that they were just looking for friends and no royos. Um, the, the study, I don't know if you knew this, Matt, but the study actually had to be suspended because an ape broke the tablet. Ooh, holy God. So those were some really good uh, lady monkey pictures, huh? Oh. No, no, no. It was actually a female ape that broke it because she received an unsolicited dick pic. And just smash the towers. Fuck the patriarchy. Just, I don't want to see your penis, ape. Some things transcend species. Right? All right. Ugh. Moving along. <laughs> New research by a parasitologist and proud former Ohioan, a Dr. Kelly Wienersmith, who I did go to high school with. She discovered a new species of wasp 
This wasp is called a crypt keeper. And this is really actually neat. So this is true. So they called the, the wasp Arutus uh, Set. And Set is an e Egyptian god known to like fuck with other people, right? Technical term. <laughs> so what happens is this wasp, it, it lays its eggs in trees right next to the larvae of other wasps. And then the little baby crypt keeper wasps then go infect the other larvae, crawl into their brains, and actually take over take control of the, uh, the host wasp body. Honest to God truth. What, these, what they then do with the host body is they direct the, the host larvae to tunnel out of, the, out of the tree, and they make a hole just big enough for the parasite wasp to escape from. So this host is trapped. And in the meantime, while he's trapped there, he gets eaten alive from the inside out by the parasite wasp larvae. Yeah, this is totally horrifying. And I don't know what is more horrifying, whether it's the getting eaten alive from the inside out part, or the fact that when, like, granted the powers of mind control, all they do is dig a fucking tunnel. Like, they can think of something better to do with mind control. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I figure if I had mind control, the very first thing I would do is make everybody friend me on Facebook. That way my mother would know I had friends. She checks. Yeah, I mean... Gives me shit about it. I mean, you could do that, I guess. Or you could, like, do something cool. Like what? Like, I don't know. You could, like, start an orgy with George Clooney and Brad Pitt and... <laughs> All right, the second <laughs> thing I would do with mind control is, is probably that. <laughs> Be pretty cool. No? No orgies with Brad Pitt, huh? Fair no. enough. It's a crowd of scientists. <laughs> they don't even know who Brad Pitt is. They're like, what are movies? What's entertainment? What's That's fun? true. Anyway, <laughs> I find that this is a really horrifying way to die. And um, it's definitely in the top three of my list of ways not to die. Number one, of course, is, uh, you know, being... <laughs> being burned alive, or number two is suffocating while masturbating. Yeah. Yeah, see, see my list, the first one is no. getting burned alive while masturbating. But now, after reading this, I think I, I would, I'm like much more afraid of getting eaten alive from the inside while masturbating. <laughs> That'd be horrifying. That'd be really bad. No one wants that. Really sets the imagination off. Hmm. Um, professionals. Um, <laughs> natural selection is making education genes more and more rare. Oh. But that goes to show you, even Mother Nature doesn't like nerds. It's just science. The research from Decode, a genetics firm in Reykjavik, finds that education became a little rarer in the country from 1910 to 1975. The authors did not speculate as to why. They just kind of like left it. <laughs> and Great like, science. This is what we found. You draw your own conclusions. <laughs> I would have to say, if there's a selective pressure against those that are more educated, just proof that nobody's going to sleep with a dork. Matt says from his own experience. Womp. Aw. Nobody? Plenty of hot nerds get laid all the time, Matt. I don't like what that says about me. <laughs> Moving along. Um, in other news, neural mechanisms link alcohol consumption to binge eating. What? That's right. <laughs> These neural networks, of course, are called, seemed like a good idea at the time. Yeah. Researchers have found that in mice, this effect is induced because alcohol activates a specific set of hypothalamic neurons associated with feeding behavior. The results, published in Nature Communications, reveal a previously unrecognized link between binge drinking and binge eating. Unrecognized by who? <laughs> who doesn't know this? Scientists. I'm sorry to give scientists so much crap tonight. I don't know. I, I think I was pretty bitter when I wrote this. <laughs> anyway, let's talk about the experiment, yeah? Yeah. All right, so to begin with, the team wanted to establish whether or not binge eating followed binge drinking. And so they created a, an alcoholic weekend for mice. What they did is they Rowdy. took mice. <laughs> <laughs> they injected them with enough alcohol that's equivalent to, to two bottles of wine, and they did this for three days straight. Yep. Right? Sounds like my regular life. 
Just a regular weekend. Regular weekend for Hannah. Control. Bottle half a wine. <laughs> yeah, all the mice were named Hannah. <laughs> Control animals, of course, received just a saline solution and a smug sense of superiority. <laughs> so before, three days before and after the, the dosage, the, all animals were given saline as a control. And then the animals were housed individually uh, to prov uh, prevent any group behaviors. Yeah, like mice orgies. <laughs> Classic. So, and then, then they measured how much food the mice ate. So what they found is that on the days that uh, the mice were given alcohol, both male and female mice, of course, binge ate. They ate quite a bit more than the controls. Yeah, the alternate hypothesis for this is that, that they weren't being judged when they were alone. Hmm. I'll let you guess who came up with that hypothesis. All right, so after, after establishing that these mice did in fact binge ate, what the researchers then did is sacrifice the mice and took sections of the brain of these mice, and they found that um, not only did they find evidence for deep brain ethanol, elevated levels of deep brain ethanol, so the, brain, the alcohol got in there, but they found um, a certain set of neurons were activated. They're called AGRP cells. Now, these cells are normally activated during times of fasting or hunger. So, to prove that that alcohol was triggering these neurons. The mice were then, a new set of mice, of course, <laughs> were then treated with an inhibitor that blocks the activity of these neurons, and they found that the, the binge-drinking mice did not binge eat in response. Yeah. So, binge-drinking now definitely, definitely is associated with binge-eating. Yeah. The mice, though, did, did say that those kebabs they had were fucking amazing, and they had no regrets. <laughs> they Instagrammed a picture of it. What I'm curious about now, though, is whether or not watching sports activates the same neurons. Because I don't know about you guys, but... Yeah, and I, I mean, even though they overate, I'm sure they had a small breakfast in the morning to compensate. <laughs> it's okay. All right, but the real question here, though, is what did these mice feel like, right? Like, what drove them to drink so much? Science, probably. <laughs> it's true. It was science. Science. All right, so... That was your comedy news and science. Comedy news and science. Yes. So with that, I would like to welcome on our guest for the, the evening. Uh, our guest is the esteemed Dr. Kadri Race. She's a geneticist at the CRG, uh, PhD, and is now an advocate for effective altruism. Welcome, Dr. Kadri Reese. Hey, Kadri. Hello, hello. Yay. I don't want to drink. Is it on? Is it on? No, it's not. No, it's on. Yes. Hello. <laughs> Only the best technical support for this show, folks. <laughs> <laughs> the best and the brightest. All right. So before we get into effective altruism, what that is and what it does, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself for those of you, for those in the audience who didn't get to see you on the show before. You didn't get to see me. Yeah. yeah so I'm uh, I'm Kadri, and I'm uh, my background is uh, epigenetics. So I recently finished my studies, uh, doctoral studies in epigenetics. So I'm a scientist, as Matt. Not like me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and um, yeah. So what else? We're, we're both blonde, though. <laughs> <laughs> that yeah. makes you a scientist. <laughs> we have we have something in common. That's what I'm trying to say. Because she has so much in common with you in terms yeah, of her studies. Yeah, we studying. have so much in common with <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, you both study, like, who else studies epigenetics? Is that, like, a thing? Anybody? <laughs> Do you have any other geneticists in the, in the crowd? Boo. <laughs> That's right, genetics suck. What was, your, what was your research about, just briefly? <laughs> so, yeah, last time we talked about that. So, uh, I study epigenetics, which is basically uh, trying to understand uh, how uh, uh, genes can be expressed and uh, also the, the, 
uh, how we can influence the gene expression. So it's uh, epigenetics, that everything is that's on, the, on the genes. It, which is actually very interesting because it means that uh, we have much more power over our bodies and our minds and uh, how we live our lives. So for example, with the, uh, uh, you know, the things we eat and uh, the things we drink, <coughs> and uh, you know, like basically how we live our lives. And uh, it uh, also it's shown that it also can be inherited. So we have to think that our lifestyle will also affect our kids. Well. So watch out Cheers. when you drink, yeah? <laughs> All right, so but now you've moved on to being an advocate for effective altruism, or this is something that you do in your, your spare time such that you have, right? But what, so can you, who do you, who do you work for? Can you explain effective altruism and what, what you do to advocate it? Uh, well, actually, this is not a new thing. So I, uh, I've been like involved in this in uh, whatever level since uh, four years. Uh, I started uh, reading about it and I was lucky enough to be invited to some of the events um, in London and also in the United States. So I got to meet a lot of uh, inspiring people, and um, I think it's uh, you know it it's, it has been a long way because uh, you know it, it basically it took me f it still takes me time to really understand uh, what is it all about and how can we um, uh, change um, the way we think and uh, how we kind of um, help the world or something. Right. So what is it? So what is it? Yes. So um, <clears throat> effective altruism is a um, philanthropic movement, uh, but it's also kind of a, a lifestyle and um, way of thinking, I think, mostly. And it's uh, based on morality. So I think it really starts from the, the, that you have to have internally the need to want to help people. And I think this is like where it really starts, because I think the effective altruists, the community itself, they often focus on the second level, which is where the name comes from. It's like when we have the desire on, and the decision to do something good, that we do it as effectively as possible. So we basically always have the kind of the boring scientific analysis of, of the projects that we are giving the money to, and, uh, and we also analyze after the project uh, has uh, finished, like what actually happened to the money. Because this is often the problem with um, a lot of small charities and uh, kind of these um, projects that uh, no one really cares uh, afterwards what happened. We just want to do good and we just like give money and we feel good in, in, like, you know, inside because, oh yeah, I did something, something good. But actually often the, the money might have been um, like way better somewhere else and uh, you know be more good uh, might have been done so this is the kind of the the main idea of the effective altruism so that, that might be a good way to convince people to do it is be like hey like you feel good about giving to charity <laughs> well you're wrong because you're not doing it right this is how you do it and then you can actually feel good about yourself yeah so that was my impression of infect of effective altruism so altruism of course is uh, is is you know the desire to give just for the sake of giving and doing good right and what the, where this came up from as i understand is how to make sure that when you give money to charities your money is going as far as it can doing as the most good as possible cuz right now if you give to the red cross or to say me maybe that money wouldn't be used for for truly helping the less fortunate but then um, as you know, like I said, as I understand it, a group of people from Silicon Valley, they decided to actually study where the money went and try to quantify how, how much good it does in the world. Is that, is that like a fair summary? Mm, yes, I, but I don't know why you say Silicon Valley, because actually it mostly started from Oxford. Uh, so there yeah. were like some uh, guys who... <laughs> Fucking British people. <laughs> well, no, see... <laughs> I think that's how you can tell I'm an, I'm an American, because whatever England did, I just take credit for. I guarantee you that the U.S. invented the internet, right? So, but yeah, basically this is this is kind of the idea, yes, and um, yeah, the, because they uh, like a lot of uh, smart people have uh, realized that often the um, like the way uh, we do things it's not really based on analysis and because it, like people don't really it's, it's a very tedious and boring work most of the time because you have to really uh, analyze uh, like especially after the project is done what really happened to those things 
And uh, also they, they would do this kind of um, prioritization of, of problems. So they uh, try to understand uh, what in the world are the most uh, prevalent uh, issues that we should deal with. Because often, like they often say that the, the most, um, like the most uh, uh, hazardous things are not the most um, disturbing. So often like, the thing that you see in front of you, like you see, uh, uh, like for example, there is a, um, they often bring this example, there's a girl who uh, disappeared and she, I don't know, um, got, uh, got into a well or something and every news, uh, uh, news are like publishing about it. But because it's in front of you and everybody cares and everybody's very disturbed. But when you think about, uh, you know, like the, the kids you actually don't see and uh, somehow it is so, so much more um, easy to ignore all the other suffering in the world because it's not really in front of you. You don't have to see it like there. So it's either this one kid who, who is really disturbing you because like she's lost and maybe starving because she uh, fell in a well just behind your house. But actually, the, you can compare it to this. Their kids uh, fallen in wells and yeah, world so countries it's like across the, the, the planet. It's just also like the the, the effective author is also like really uh, uh, focus on the human psychology of all of this because uh, the um, yeah I think that's where it all kind of comes together. Like the our uh, moral motivation and human psychology are not often uh, aligned to the to the reality that we live in. So, so, so wait, what would effective altruists say about like giving money to homeless people on the street? Is that it's effective? not effective? It's not effective at all. No, I'm not really. But I mean, but, but like this is the kind of the thing where you can maybe start. Um, you can trigger your um, moral motivation to do stuff. So like you can still. Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, um, use this as a, as a leverage point or something to. Just should I them. should I not move myself? <laughs> and uh, yeah, but uh, yeah, of course, like giving. Uh, I mean, because you you want to do it because you see that moment of a day you are not hungry and you see that the guy on the street and you want to give him a euro. I mean, probably you can do it because, you know, it, it's something for him. But at the same time, it's obviously I'm never not, not, hungry, not, not so, effective. Uh, so so I, I want to ask two kind of two questions. I have a two part question. <laughs> <laughs> Favorite for scientists. Um, no, the things I want to talk about, though, are how how these things are quantified and how they're thought of. So first, though, what when you go about prioritizing needs. So what are, the, what are the things that effective altruists are trying to consider in prioritizing needs? As I, right, like the number of people you can help is probably mm -hmm. the first. And then how low there's, or how much they're suffering compared to everybody worldwide. So if Kanye West's house gets destroyed in a, in a hurricane, we shouldn't donate money to hurricane relief, yeah? We should uh, buy malarial nets. What? This is a question. <laughs> yeah, like, where was the question exactly? Right. That was a very the strange is, scenario that you sorry, set out. I don't know. So how a, do you do because that? Kanye West's house got burned down, we should all buy malaria nets. So no, I'm saying instead of giving Kanye money. So what, yeah. are, what are the priorities, first off? And then we're going to talk about how you quantify whether or not your charitable dollars are successful. So the, the priorities... Um, are, I think that they, they uh, I don't follow this uh, technical parts, you know, like on a daily basis, but there, there are, for example, uh, some organizations in uh, Oxford uh, where they, like, for example, give well, where they do uh, this kind of evaluations. So um, I think they are base, basing their um, evaluations on the like, marginal value per one dollar, like how much uh, potential, like this, some... Uh, like certain amount of money can uh, save people's lives. So, for example, I think for many years the um, the Malaria, Mar Malaria Net uh, Association uh, was one of the top list because the one net can actually really uh, save uh, potentially a lot of uh, kids' lives. So this was, uh, for example, one of the priorities. Exactly, and that was that's where I was trying to lead you because the idea is that if you give a dollar to buy malarial nets and you could. With that one dollar, you could pay for 10 nets and save 10 lives, opposed to giving that dollar to put half a brick into Kanye's new hurricane-relieved house. Right? This is where the prioritization Is this like a real matters. thing that happened? Did Kanye West's house get no. destroyed? Well, like, I was thinking Hurricane Sandy that impacted the New York region. Yeah. Sorry, it was a bad example. <laughs> okay, so we have our priorities. Help those uh, 
where the money will go the furthest, yeah? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So then what are, what, how do you measure whether or not that's successful? Um, <clears throat> <laughs> or don't. Well, I mean, don't like, measure it. No, it's fine. No, no, no. They, they, like, they do it. I mean, I don't know particularly about the details because uh, this is not like one of my uh, like primary interests in effective altruism. But uh, but I think that's that's kind of uh, you know you can check it out if you if we want to actually know. Like like I think that's already good that they have these kind of organizations that do focus on. Uh, on um, you know actually evaluating where does the money go because often the like they have uh, published a lot of um, reports where some charities uh, they get a lot of money but then it, it turns out that it's all kind of admi administrative costs that are mostly like actually swallowing the money and this is very obviously not where you want to put your money in so I think that's uh, that's why this kind of um, evaluation uh, you know it's, it's important. All right, so administrative costs is one of the, yeah, one of the outputs. Yeah, for sure. But you, you mentioned, though, that this is not your actual primary interest in it. So what, mm. what drew you to effective altruism? So, th thank you for asking. <laughs> because, like, this is... It took me 20 minutes, it's right. <laughs> <laughs> no, because as I said in the beginning, I think there is a, a... For me, at least in my head, there are two different levels in effective altruism. So one is really to uh, kind of... Um, like trying to nudge people towards uh, thinking this way, to actually want to help and to understand how, uh, in what kind of uh, world we live in. Like because like in this uh, bar for where we're sitting, we are all basically like super rich people. Like you know there is uh, you know uh, immense kind of the luxury that we have every day, and uh, so I think that the kind of this um, uh, kind of this moral. Uh, motivation and the nudging and the way of of thinking. I think this is the way to start because, like, there is like one of the advocates of effective altruism, Peter Singer. Like, like, he often talks about obligation that we, as a, you know, living in the Western world, comfortably we have to give. But I'm more towards the opportuni opportunist uh, part of like way of thinking because I think one should want to give. So I think we should see it as a, we have an opportunity to do something. Uh, you know for the uh, people who are less fortunate than we. And I think this is, has been, for me, like the main interesting pathway, uh, you know, meeting those people is uh, kind Did of... Did you just not realize that people needed help before this, or...? <laughs> like, sure, but that, I think that's, that's why I also started, uh, like, going into that way, because, like, the, the feeling of the guilt is not enough to... for me to actually do something, because, I, as a scientist I am, I do because want to... Because you're a robot. No, because I also do want to know that my money is going somewhere where it's meaningful because yeah. I often thought it's like, okay, I do feel that I want to do something, but so what should I do? Because the only things you read often is like, oh, charities are not good and blah, blah. So I thought, okay, let's then uh, look really uh, where and how does it go uh, when you want to actually do something, you know, you know, that you know that you are doing something good. Because it's, uh, you know, like, I don't believe in this that, okay, I just gave money away and now I feel better. I, I don't believe in it's just like feeling better. I want to also uh, actually know that this money went somewhere and that actually it did something. You, so you want to do this not just for yourself and for that joy of being like, I'm better than this homeless man that I gave a, a year or two. You want to make sure it makes a difference. Yes. That, so what, that what, is very admirable. What do you give to? Like what charities do you? So um, <laughs> unfortunately, the last uh, year I've been uh, unemployed, so I'm not giving. But uh, so, for example, there is uh, no. But that's the thing as well. It's like I, I'm not here as um, you know trying to be like the moral model or like the role model for for uh, you know like telling you it's like you should do like me because I'm definitely not doing the right things because I'm realizing that there is still like my moral. Uh, landscape is still, um, you know, not shaped well enough. But I, I do know that uh, that I have uh, like a big interest in this, and I think, like, my also one of my main motivations is to uh, to kind of, uh, you know, tell people because I think there are a lot of people who are who are very like fucking rich and that they just don't uh, see this like point in how much this uh, their 
you know, because like there's a lot of friends I have, they give uh, like naturally 10% of whatever they earn, like whatever it is. Like if you are, you know, on uh, unemployed payment money, like you give 10%. If you get a lot to, uh, you know, like you get uh, 3,000 euros per month, you still get 10%. So there's an organization where you can actually sign up, you give a pledge, and whatever you get, you give 10%. And this goes to this kind of uh, affected charities. Mm -hmm. And I think, for example, this is something that I am really going to do. I, I did it three years ago, or two years ago, uh, but yeah, as I'm unemployed, I, I'm not doing it now, so. That's right, you do what you can. Now, <clears throat> before we wrap up though, I wanted to ask uh, for, the, so the audience now, everybody wants to learn more about effective altruism, am I right? Yeah. Yes, of course. So where can we go to check it out? Who, who do you advocate for? Where, where do you suggest we look? Just Google it? So, yeah, yeah, Google it, but I have to say, like, um, so Peter Singer is definitely one of those advocates, but as I said, like, he's more this uh, obligation type of person, so he makes you feel guilty about those kind of things. He, he does. Yeah. Really so, awful. but, like, uh, I, I, had an, uh, I had the fortune to meet uh, William Magaskill a few years ago in Oxford, so he's one of those people who has uh, studied the different organizations in Oxford, and he also recently wrote a book about it, so I definitely would suggest to uh, Google him and like check out his uh, projects and stuff. And uh, definitely his book as well. And there is a very interesting uh, podcast uh, uh, with uh, William Magaskill and Sam Harris where they talk about it. And a very kind of in a logical uh, way that after these two hours you really think it's like, oh shit, I really want to do something. So I think this is a very interesting uh, podcast. Do you remember the name of the podcast? It's Sam Harris and William Magaskill. So it's, oh. uh, if you just Google those uh, two names. We can, we can post all this. We'll post all this on our Facebook page. Sure. We can post all these references that Kadri's making. So if you guys want to check it out, give us a like while you're Or here. you can just write, <laughs> email me, like message me. I will help you. She's very we'll lonely. We'll give you Kadri's <laughs> personal phone number. We're, <laughs> we can call uh, her up two in the morning. <laughs> so with that, I'd like, uh, are there any questions from the audience for Kadri about effective algorithms? Anne, yeah, come up to the front. Great yeah, question. Yeah, the question is, is there like a trip advisor for charities, like that rates the charities? Yes, so for example, this uh, give well, it's not really a trip advisor, but it is based on uh, ratings, but not by how much people like them, but uh, actually on what they do. So it's like kind of trip advisor with, um, with uh, data. <laughs> so. give, give well com. <laughs> Right, givewell.com. Yeah, well. <laughs> All right, we have a question over here. Hey, thank you very much for the interesting talk. Um, you mentioned that your primary interest is in the area of how to persuade people to contribute more, to uh, give away more. So can you tell us more about those, what, what's a good way to persuade people to give more to charity? So this is actually a good question because I've been asking them that myself uh, for a very long time. So the, the good way is definitely to, um, like, I think you still have to have like a certain feeling inside you that you actually want to do something because then it's easy because then, uh, because that's what happened to me and then I started Googling, I met a lot of people, I made friends with people who actually do this and then when you are already in, in, inside this community, it just makes sense, you know, that you don't even, you start thinking, uh, you know, along the same pathways. But before that, I don't really know, because I think the, the only way is to kind of, um, you know, talk about it. But also, like, I don't think that this is a kind of guilt and obligation is, because like, you, you don't want to also just force people, because, it, uh, because then you would probably do it maybe uh, for a few months out of guilt. But we are trying to maximize, like, how much good you can do over your lifetime. So if you do it just for a few months, it's not going to be enough. So I think the... the the way of like change, changing the thinking has to come somehow inside. I don't know, morality. Like yeah, I, I don't. I mean, like, that, that's that's like one of my biggest issues. Like seriously, yeah. It was like it was like what I, I said to Kadri earlier that it's it's hard enough to get people to give money at all, and then to like make them have to think about it too. It's like who wants to give money and have to think about it? Like come on, it's hard. Not this. You guy. got you got your work cut out for you, effective altruists. <clears throat> Okay, do we have any other questions? 
No? All right, so with that, I would like to thank Dr. Kadri Reese for joining us today. Thank you. Wonderful time. I want to thank everybody in the audience tonight. So we're, we're, we're going to build this up, a technically funny talk show, uh, science talk show, into something great. I'm really excited to be working with the research community here in Barcelona. I thank you to, from the bottom of my heart for joining tonight. So give yourselves a round of applause. Um, with that, I'd like to thank everybody who's on the team. Uh, DJ Charms on the one and two. Christopher Drifter is in the back. Of course, my lovely co-host, Hannah Becker. Um, I'll thank myself. And of so. course, Dr. Matthew no. Murtha. I was, no, I was basking no, no. in my own. All right, so we're going to take a, a seven and a half minute break now for drinks, a cigarette, a bathroom break, and then we're going to come back for the Comedy Lab. There'll be a comedy game show and stand up by some of the city's best comedians. Stick around, enjoy. Please stick around, it's going to be so fun. Thank you very much.